Hi, Glenn. Hello, Bray. How are you doing? I'm holding on here in uh, you know overcast and uh, chilly um, Brookline, Massachusetts. Excellent. Well, let's uh, introduce ourselves for our viewers. I'm Brent Lindsay from the Kaufman Foundation. And I am Glenn Lowry of Brown University. And uh, we thought we would uh, start off our conversation with the horrific catastrophe in Japan. Um, as we speak, uh, it sounds like half a million people are homeless and uh, several nuclear power plants are uh, in bad shape. And so the full scale of this uh, nightmare is, is still, I think, uh, quite some time away from being known. Uh, but uh, I don't know. <sighs> you want to say something in the face well, of something so huge. Say? Yes. This is um, so I guess on the one hand, uh, one can say that uh, if horrible natural disasters are to hit, uh, it's much better uh, when they hit in rich countries than when they hit in poor countries. It looks like thousands have died in, in this earthquake as compared to hundreds of thousands who died in the earthquake and tsunami that hit uh, in 2004, uh, the, okay. earth, uh, the earthquake off Indonesia. Uh, so so there are great, great advantages in, in uh, the economic growth and prosperity uh, that not only make us have uh, more fun and more options and good times, but that just better shield us from the elements uh, in bad times. Uh, so, so that's that's the uh, that's the silver lining of this. Uh, but on the other hand, there's something I think kind of especially jarring. Maybe it's some kind of socioeconomic bigotry on my part, uh, but but just uh, especially disorienting to see one of the richest, most advanced countries on earth uh, with probably the the best earthquake preparedness on earth, uh, the most stringent nuclear power plant safety standards on earth being completely overwhelmed uh, by a force of nature. We're used, to, uh, we're used to seeing people in poor countries, uh, you know, uh, pushed to the wall by, uh, by natural forces. It's, uh, it's humbling to see that, uh, that despite all of our uh, accomplishments, uh, the ground can shake and, uh, and just totally well, put, I mean, put everything would... into chaos. Okay, so here's pushback. I mean, I <laughs> how can there be an argument about the tragedy in Japan? Okay, but here's pushback. Um, because there's a kind of, um, well, what's the word? Uh, uh, I, I don't quite find the right uh, term, but I, there, there's something I'm objecting to, and you're drawing the contrast. I mean, I, I don't know why it comes to mind what the relevancy of the contrast is it of course goes without saying that if you have uh, hundreds of thousands of people living in coastal low-lying areas in uh, not particularly built up uh, you know not particularly uh, modern village life and a great wave comes that the implications will be much more dire in terms of loss of life than would be the case in a, in a highly advanced industrial society with, uh, you know, uh, trillions of dollars of infrastructure uh, in place and et cetera. Uh, the human capital of its people and the, the sort of uh, thickness of its uh, uh, institutional structures and yep. such. I mean, I, you know, that's what it goes without saying. So the fact that that contrast is called to mind <laughs> makes me want to turn the light of investigation on the questioner. Uh, because I, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot of insight in the observation about the difference. But why are we putting it in those terms? And you said there's something humbling about it. And and so maybe the word that I'm looking for here is something about, I don't know, a kind of arrogant presumption <laughs> of of being rich uh, that uh, you shouldn't be subject uh, to or would be somehow exempt from. And I'm sorry if I impute too much to you. I really do apologize if I do. But uh, I don't know. Do you see what I mean? Uh I guess, uh, but I would say <laughs> I, I would I would say that uh, the you know the, to to borrow from a recent book title by Robert Fogel the the number one economic priority the bottom step of the of Maslow's pyramid is escape from premature death uh, and and so uh, that is that is an obsession for. 
21st century residents of advanced economies. Uh, yes. We spend we spend 15 to 20 percent of our income on health care, maybe half of which does absolutely no good at the margins. Uh, but we care. I'm playing, but okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to argue with right, you. Right. Right. So anyway, a certain uh, a significant chunk of which is uh, is is cost ineffective. Uh, but we care about staving off premature death, and uh, we spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of attention on it. And that's the number one thing, right? So once once you got that out of the way, you can start focusing on, on other needs. Uh, but physical survival uh, is uh, is job one. Uh, but what's for, your point? For, so, um, you know, perhaps... I mean, relative yeah, to the comparison yeah, right, of Aceh right, so uh, right. to, uh, to the east coast of Japan. So I, wrote, uh, yeah. so I wrote a book uh, called The Age of Abundance, which was about how societies change when they can basically take physical survival and physical security for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, that, that is an amazing thing that has happened in the rich countries of the world, and it is a novel thing. Uh, okay. it's, o it's only in the past uh, you know, 50 to 100 years that there have been societies where the, the majority of people were insulated from the specter of premature death and also from the specter of just material want. And, they and can, so then, and then a tsunami and an earthquake come, and they wreck the nuclear power plants and threaten meltdown, and they overwhelm uh, of an island population and uh, of an advanced country that has gotten itself to the other side of this great divide of abundance provision. And um, and we realize that uh, we can't take these things for granted that we take for granted. Uh -huh. but perhaps it's a banal observation because everybody has it when they have a heart attack or. Uh, a, a medical scare uh, that uh, you can't. Well, we're all ultimately going to die, and you and you can't take these things for granted, and you live your life as if other things are of life and death importance when they really but, are. But, but what about? Uh, but this is sort of a social wake-up call that, uh, just like on the, on an individual scale, you spend your life sweating, uh, you know, life's petty stresses until you uh, you you dodge the big one and. Uh, and live to, to uh, worry another day, and you start thinking, well, I'm going to worry about different things. I'm going to appreciate what I have more. Um, when when the you know the rug gets pulled out from under a whole society that was taking their way of life for granted, and now everything's in rubble, uh, then then perhaps it, I think it's a not a natural reaction for all the rest of us to think there, but for the grace of God, go I. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask about the. Um implications of the global society in which the uh, capacity for the um, for, uh, you know obtaining security and uh, a sense of uh, taken for grantedness about uh, being immune to the uh, terrible um, you know potential effects of the natural environment amongst other things economic deprivation uh, a violation by war and uh, being ravaged by you know civil disorder we take all for granted the the fact that we have it but this uh, security is not uh, is not uh, uniformly distributed. No. I, mean, you, I mean, and I don't mean to say that therefore it's somebody's fault or therefore that the committee has to redistribute it to make it better. I just mean, what are the existential implications of living in a world in which existential, even for those of us who are rich and safe? I mean, what are we required to do in the way we think about ourselves and our position and the way in which we carry ourselves in the world in light of the fact that we are the beneficiaries of a beneficence that is uh, that is not at all uniformly distributed. And when you talk about health care and, you know, obsession of the New York Times Sunday Magazine had a piece recently about a billionaire guy who wants to live to be 120 or 150 or something like that. Right. And therefore now at the age of 87 he eats no salt, sugar, whatever, whatever. Right. He has a fiber thing going and whatever. And I assume he's got all kind of medical technology going. If he gets a sore throat, it's a major, uh, it's a major event. And I was made to think as I read through this quickly about a world that could happen, I mean, could happen given technology at all in 50, 75, or 100 years in which people really could think of living for 120 or 150. Sure. Uh, you know, they get their joints replaced, they uh, forestall the, the onset of any of the kind of debilitating, uh, you know, diseases that take us out. And uh, then uh, God knows, um, with, with biometric integration of all kinds, you know, who knows? Uh, about their mental acuity, about the capacity to retain their vision and their uh, audio, uh, oral uh, uh, senses, and so on. And and I thought too, such a world, 150 or 50 years from now, would certainly not have the ability to deliver that life-transforming possibility 
uh, to all but a very few people on earth. And I envision a society, a global society, in which there were some who literally were supermen. L literally, in virtue of their ability to command resources, which was ultimately political and was ultimately buttressed by force and the threat of force, they would be amongst the chosen one-tenth of one percent of humanity who would walk into a new world. Yeah. And the prospect was chilling. And I thought, if you're rich and if, you're, uh, if you have the leisure to reflect, uh, you ought to think critically about such developments, not, not to be a celebrant of them, not be in, somehow in awe of them and uh, become a cheerleader uh, to such a development. Well, uh, I'm a cheerleader uh, because, uh, <laughs> okay. because because I, I don't take the static view. I, I think that that any uh, you know uh, medical technology that comes along benefits a tiny rich few first, and that is the process by which uh, the the producers of those uh, you know wonder cures uh, go down the learning curve and learn how to produce things more cheaply. And so, uh, it is the story of all. Uh, welfare enhancing products uh, that their costs go down over time and they do that uh, by selling to rich people first and so it is the way of things for rich people to be the uh, guinea pigs and uh, and also just the early beneficiaries of, of new products uh, and then uh, through competition uh, and uh, and profit seeking uh, there are markets in there are market there are markets for getting uh, more and more customers uh, signed up for I'm whatever it is you're I'm, selling. I'm an economist, man. I know I know the yeah, story. So, I know so, how why, it goes. so, so yeah, so, but, but, so I mean, so what, would you have in 19 you know 07, the year before Henry Ford invented the assembly line? Would you have? Uh, or sorry, that was the year before he invented the Model T. Would you have bemoaned the automobile for for putting us, oh, you know, creating no, no. this invidious distinction between the people who had to walk in the mud and people who got to ride around on motorized vehicles? The answer is no, and I don't think the uh, only alternatives are cheerleading or being, I don't know, a luddite. You know, yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not against progress or suggesting in any way that rich people be in, inhibited from uh, purchasing these things. What, what I was trying to say was in light of the implications of such disparity, and I don't buy your, your view, which I think is a little rosy, the scenario where, you know, we all get to uh, heaven because, uh, you know, we move down the cost curve and everything becomes a lot cheaper and a lot more. I mean, I agree that that has been the story with respect to washing machines. Uh, I, it remains to be made clear to me that all oh, it's the story with respect to organ transplants, for example. It's, it's and, I was, and I was talking about a hypothetical world in which there was a much more dependent upon the technological infrastructure in order to be able to provide, I don't know, the integrated circuit in your brain that prevented the Alzheimer's or whatever, whatever, and, and imagined, you know, that there could be this kind of inequality amongst people. But anyway, I mean, just to uh, yeah. uh, finish, what I was saying was, don't we have to think differently about ourselves and our world in light of the disparities of possibility, the disparities of dreams, uh, that could be, uh, you know, credibly or plausibly held. I'm talking about people living to 150 years old. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, amongst the uh, the global society, now, isn't there a political uh, element uh, to that and a moral element to that, which doesn't necessarily have to issue in, you know, some kind of quote social policy or some kind of you know tax or something? I, I mean, no, I, I think absolutely. Yeah. So uh, yeah. the um, so first. Uh, Yes, there is something chilling about uh, about physical differences between the rich and the poor, uh, and and on the whole, we have seen those physical differences diminish over the course of the 20th century. Rich people used to be a lot taller than poor people because they were malnourished, uh, and and those height differences have diminished over time. Life expectancy differences between, say, American whites and American blacks have diminished sharply over the, the past hundred years, although they have. We're starting to see divergences again in, in health and life expectancy measures between the rich and the poor, and that even even within the rich United States, and that is uh, that's that's something that we should not be at all complacent about, and that should be a, a subject of real concern. And of course, the differences between rich and poor in a rich country like the United States are dwarfed by the differences between uh, you know rich Americans uh, of, of wherever they are on the economic scale and and Bangladeshis. Uh, so. 
absolutely there is moral urgency to let me let me uh, let me to, illustrate to my the, point to about the fact of global poverty. Let me illustrate my point about politics, immigration. Okay, yes. I, that, what I mean is the general phenomenon of population movement across a politically uh, defined uh, you know geographic division. Okay, so. So that's a huge political question. I mean, not just in terms of electoral politics and debates in Washington, but also in terms of politics in some more cosmic sense, right? I mean, it's about power. Uh, it, it's about dividing up humankind in ways and having permissions for participation in certain kind of collective uh, enterprises, which then are the instrumentality through which various benefits get bestowed. And, and um, I, I'm, I'm not arguing with you here, Frank. I'm not trying to counter no. anything that you've said. I'm trying to actually, you know, I mean, sort of agree about the uh, salience of, the, of this t these technologically based uh, disparities that are coming into existence, but then try to reflect about, you know, sort of what are the, I mean, because I'm not at all, I, I'm saying, what are the moral and political implications of the divisions that come about because of these technological advances and this dynamic and unfolding thing? I'm not at all persuaded, for example, that nationalism stands up very well to critical scrutiny. I don't have a thesis to unfold here, just this yep. just a kind of conjecture or instinct. Stands up very well to critical scrutiny when you think about a global society of uh, 6, 8 billion, 10, 12 billion in due course people and uh, all, of, all of the machinations that are afoot needed to sustain uh, the, the privileges and the divisions and the <laughs> and and uh, whatnot and you know um, anyway that's I'm, I'm kind yeah, of yeah well I'm I'm a as a supporter of very liberal immigration policies you know you're you're preaching to the choir oh that's good to know if, that's uh, good to know if uh, if you want to look at this in in sort of economic policy terms there's there's no greater interference with the global economy no more sort of brute. Uh, uh, defiance of market forces than the way in which we have carved up labor markets in terms yeah. of these arbitrary political boundaries. Uh, yeah. So we were talking about the moral urgency of global poverty. Well, what do you do about it? And the fact is uh, that uh, that our leverage to help other uh, people overcome uh, the poor institutions and and whatever other uh, factors lead to them being uh, impoverished. Our, our leverage isn't that great. Uh, we've been trying, uh, you know, since World War II to figure out uh, a development policy for rich countries, and, and we've had, you know, a, a string of disappointments uh, in terms of, of our actually accelerating the process through policy. Uh, but the easiest thing you can do to, uh, to help uh, people in poor countries is let them move to rich countries. They automatically increase their income and the income for their families through remittances many fold. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, we, the rich countries, collectively, are ex incredibly stingy about doing so, uh, and uh, and uh, and that's not a good thing. Yeah, we agreed on that. Uh, let's talk about limits to growth. Yeah. So, so if, uh, anyway, I started off feeling all gloomy about uh, about Japan, uh, yeah. and uh, so. Uh, that leads to another gloomy subject, which is uh, Tyler, although uh, decidedly uh, uh, on a lesser scale uh, of worry, uh, worrying about uh, uh, about our dollars and cents rather than about life and death. Um, and and the subject here is Tyler Cowen's new ebook, uh, The Great Stagnation, in which he is arguing, uh, well, he is starting with the observation uh, that. Uh, that growth in the United States has slowed down uh, significantly uh, over the past generation compared to the decades after World War II. Uh, it not only slowed down here, it slowed down in other rich countries as well. Um, and uh, he argues that that's the new normal. Uh, we can't expect to go back uh, to the way things were uh, because uh, a, a variety of um, sources of what he calls low-hanging fruit, or easy opportunities for robust growth, are, have been progressively exhausted, and we're now uh, in a state of affairs where uh, further growth at historical rates is going to be uh, hard and perhaps beyond our capacities, uh, and so uh, we ought to get used to it. So it's a it's a it's a council of uh, more or less despair. Um, but now the we here is the USA. Yeah, although I think it, it applies to other rich countries as well. Um, so. So uh, that, uh, it doesn't apply at all 
uh, to um, to poor countries who's who in the past ten or fifteen years have had uh, faster growth for more people uh, than any other period in human history. The past ten or fifteen years have seen enormous. Uh, diminutions in global poverty, uh, huge uh, strides in standard of living. L in other words, know, India, led by India, India and China, right? India but, and China have come on. The, so, that's right. but but what are the low hanging fruit? Let's go back to it, Cal. Yeah. So he he argues uh, one low hanging one bit of low hanging fruit is uh, is well an old fashioned American bit of low hanging fruit is free land. Uh, we ran out of that a hundred years ago. Okay. Natural um, resources. Uh, what else, what other low hanging fruit? Um, he argues uh, that technological innovation is getting harder and harder, uh, and uh, as evidenced by, uh, which I think is probably true, uh, that is the most obvious ideas, are, it's a diminishing return story, the most obvious ideas are found first once we, once we started sort of <coughs> marrying uh, the scientific method with technological development. Uh, the, the best ideas came online first, and it gets harder and harder to come up with new good ideas, as evidenced, uh, by, as evidenced by the fact that we have uh, substantially uh, a, a huge uh, increase in the number of scientists, engineers, and researchers relative to back in the day, and yet our growth rate hasn't corresponded uh, of course, it hasn't, hasn't As if scientific progress were a function of the number of engineers? Uh, okay. Uh, but no, I mean I'm not persuaded at all uh, yeah. by all of these uh, scientific formulations about diminishing returns. Not in the least. Yeah. But go on. So, all right. So, uh, anyway, so there are no hanging fruit. Then I'll comment. At, I'll comment at greater length. All right. This is Tyler's story, not mine. Um, yeah. Okay. Fair and uh, and then he uh, he argues that uh, <laughs> we've 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 run out of what he calls or we're running out of what he calls smart but uneducated kids. Uh, that once upon a time you had a bunch of, uh, you had, uh, well, in 1900 you had uh, uh, a high school graduation rate of, of 6%. You had a college graduation rate of, uh, of I think, 0.25%. Uh, um, and, and so uh, uh, we've seen huge increases in, in uh, you know, secondary education first and then post-secondary education over the course of the 20th century. In both cases, progress has stalled. In both cases, progress will ne necessarily stall because you, you 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 can't get past 100 percent. So ultimately, this is this is okay. Land, right. ideas, and kids. What else? Yeah, th those are the big three. Okay, um, Man, I got a comment. Okay, please. <laughs> uh, <coughs> long time ago, I actually used to work on R and the economics of R and D type uh, problems when I was a young economist. And so I spent a little bit of time thinking about it and know a little bit about the literature. But I'm not pulling a card here. I'm not making any claim about expertise. Okay. I just don't buy the analogy. Uh, you would find the um, biggest stones first if they were randomly distributed in some mound of earth and you went digging looking for stones. But ideas are not like that. And uh, progress of ideas are not like that. I mean, for example, produce what? I mean, you can invent whole new... Um, ways in which human beings can find it gratifying to spend their time, uh, which would then have implications for quote unquote growth, because how is growth measured? It's measured by some kind of GDP or something like that. Uh, uh, I don't, the, the, the uh, range over which the technical solutions of problems is to be applied is itself endogenous. This is kind of what I want to say. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't see. A limit. I don't see a, a fixity uh, to ideas. I, I, you know, I mean, there may be some kind of second law of thermodynamics, or some kind of, you know, uh, at some very, very macro level, some kind of limit <coughs> that you can put. But I don't think goods and services and economy is like that at all. I mean, I think um, uh, what we define to be consumption. I mean, uh, how we. You know, I mean, I can think of all kind of science fiction uh, analogies to imagine here people living in tubes uh, hooked up to a network of computers which cause certain sensations or right. electrical impulses to occur in their brains. Uh, and that's experienced as a kind of nirvana that is a kind of, you know, national income over the Zen times higher than what we have right, uh, right now, and yet everybody's in a barn somewhere. Uh, I mean, you know, or, I mean, I'm, and I'm making this up. I mean, I'm literally making this up. Or, you know, quantum leaps, like the discovery of whole new 
technical possibilities such as the uh, advent of the atom and uh, the, uh, the whole, uh, you know, both in terms of uh, weaponry and geopolitical politics and also in terms of nuclear power and all that and in terms of our, you know, I, I, don't, I don't get the, I mean, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm babbling because I don't get, I don't see how you would apply diminishing returns to ideas and I reject yep. the analogy of yeah, well, finding well, the me, best ones first. Well, let, <clears throat> let, me, let me first register uh, agreement on the bottom line, uh, but then offer a qualified defense of, of Tyler's insight. Okay. Um, so we're talking about ideas. We yeah. also have to talk about land and we have to talk about kids. Yeah, so land I think is boring. Uh, yeah, so land the United, is The United, United States grew fine in the 20th century with, without any free land, and, and Europe hasn't had any free land in centuries, and uh, they've been doing fine. So well, I the point is, land is an input into a technology. Now, if you want to talk about agriculture, that's one thing. I mean, right. But it, again, like I said, what's being produced? What, what are the things for people so in the demand? What share of national income yeah. is spent on what? There's a whole lot of sand on the beach. You can make chips out of the silicon for a long time. Right. I think his, his two best... His two best uh, <laughs> There's a lot of water in the ocean. I mean, what is desalination, et cetera, et cetera, you know. Yeah, his two best arguments are, uh, are ideas and, and, uh, and human capital. Uh, so on ideas, uh, I think, you know, when... He's got this intuition that if someone was born in, uh, in 1900 and, 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 and died in 2000, that person, you know, if born in the rural United States, could have been born, you know, in a, a basically log cabin conditions without electricity, cars, automobiles, you know, airplanes, computers, anything. That, that, that they will have experienced over the course of their life a more dramatic change and a more dramatic improvement in human well-being than is kind of, con than, according to him, than is conceivable uh, for anybody born in later epochs. That just that the move from poverty to uh, contemporary affluence is uh, is. Uh, relative to uh, to the universe of, of sort of plausible human needs, uh, we we've had the big leap. Um, I think that uh, that with um, because I'm sorry, just to be clear, because we've run out of smart kids. Uh, no, smart just because, kids. no, because uh, well, because the the anyway, as he said, there's there's only so many good uh, there's only so many good ideas to advance the human condition, and uh, we came up with a lot of them early. Uh, I, I think that in the face of promising developments in artificial intelligence and nanotechnology and, as we were just talking about earlier, radical life extension, uh, the idea that there aren't spectacular transformational improvements in human living standards yet to come is just, I think, uh, unserious. Or, so. or that we might persuade ourselves that contemplation is the main end in life. Right. And, and, and we, we might reject, and, and let me just finish this fantasy, we might reject uh, a technological way of life. Uh, we, we might, uh, we might uh, or at least uh, we might embrace a minimalist uh, way of life, a way of life centered on the spirit, a way of life centered on prayer and contemplation, uh, that, that, that what is defined as gratification might, might be completely uh, uh, reconceived. I, I mean, all of these little calculations about limits are nested with a particular definition of what the good life is, a right, definition right, so, that, right. that has been revised again and again through human history and that is not objectively determined. Right. It's, Agreed, it's a matter but, of what we agree our purposes are. Yes, so, but, so but I, that would mean that, that economic growth as we know it would be tailing down. If people withdrew from the division of labor, withdrew from specialization ex and exchange to, you know, uh, to contemplate uh, their navel or, or tend their own garden, um, then that would be cool, and that could mark an advance in human well-being uh, by the likes of the people making those decisions. Uh, but in terms of what we call economic growth, it, 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 it uh, you know, it would mean a decline in the tr in the traded value of goods and services, or right. a, there was or certainly a stop it, it, in growth. It, it well could mean that, and of course, it's fanciful. I don't, and I don't, I don't take it seriously in the least. I'm not proposing anything. Uh, I was trying with, a, with an extreme example to try to illustrate what I think to be, take to be the fragility of this whole intellectual edifice that uh, defines progress and prosperity for ourselves in terms of, of, of economic growth by saying it was all contingent on, on some uh, prior commitments uh, that we have about how, how we're living and, as it were, who we are as human beings. Uh, and again, I'll stop talking because that's uh, you, you. You veer off into theology, and that yeah, but, <laughs> that's be, probably yeah. not part of your expertise. To, <laughs> to, to, to be, uh, <laughs> to, yeah, to be, and to be fair to, to Tyler, he, he yes. does not conflate progress and economic growth, but uh, but he does argue that GDP growth is going to 
is going to slow down and uh, and and you know post materialist values could be a part of that equation. Um, but the other, to, just to round over to his other his last bit of low hanging fruit, uh, and that's human capital. We we have. You know, there's uh, measuring it in terms of educational attainments uh, very unsatisfactory, but that's what we've got. Uh, and the fact is, the high school graduation rate peaked in the late '60s and has fallen since then. Uh, the college graduation rate uh, for you know for 30-year-olds uh, hasn't r risen since uh, 1980. Uh, and so, um, and and yet the demand for highly skilled people continues to go up in our complex and information technology intensive uh, world and, and as the result we see is this big run up in the premium for for uh, people with with college degrees um, but uh, but but our but we haven't that market signal uh, which is saying please we will pay you a lot more money if you're highly skilled uh, isn't translating into a supply of of more highly or into an appropriately robust su uh, increase in the supply of highly skilled workers, and that indicates something's. No, I get it. Stuck, I get it. And so right? we open the borders and we let in people from the global south who are uh, smart but are, are poorly educated, and we're able to get a nice hit on the return. I'm not saying Tyler is recommending this. No, he's not. Uh, but it's an implication of this line of argument. But what, what the comment that I want to make is: so you construct a society in which it's possible to incarcerate. <laughs> yeah. Two and a quarter million people. I mean, in other words, in which it's possible to have the failure of human development from the basic institutions of your society, which you construct, so um, widespread, uh, so uniform, so suffuse throughout all the various backwaters of your great land of 300 million people, that you have an underclass, uh, call it what you will, you have a class of people, and I'm not going to define them as being black or of some minority, although some of them are. Yep. Uh, who are off the table, okay? Their human development is no longer part of your growth calculation. Right. Okay? Now, uh, I don't attribute this to Tyler Cohen, whom I like. I am not saying what I'm saying now against him. Uh, that infuriates me, okay? I'm not giving up on these people, okay? The challenge is to our society to reorder its institutions in such a way that we make the best of the human resources with which we have been endowed. Not to lament and bemoan the absence of immigrants from the south and east of Europe who we could in 30 or 60 years incorporate into the engine of American economic growth in the 20th century. Yeah, so okay. I, so I agree emphatically. Uh, first of all, this isn't just about changing demographics because educational attainment amongst uh, native-born whites has slowed down too. Okay. Um, uh, secondly, uh, I, I think... The consequences or the implications for economic growth are, are perhaps the least interesting aspect of, of, of this issue, uh, which right. is which is that we have large numbers of fellow citizens whose uh, potential for thriving and flourishing is being squandered by the uh, by uh, the our inability to to have the institutions and uh, and uh, including soft institutions that will guide people to make the most of their lives, uh, and so that's a that's just a the, the looked at you know most acutely in the case of, of intergenerational poverty. This is just uh, this is just a, a tragedy of unfulfilled potential and of human lives uh, that aren't uh, being experienced nearly as richly as they could be, and uh, and there are fellow citizens, and it's it's uh, it's something to which we should be devoting urgent attention to figure out. Uh, how to improve it. Tyler's point, Tyler's point is only that you know, since the 1960s, we have been thinking very hard about this. We've been thinking about, for example, the achievement gap. Uh, we have doubled or tripled uh, real per capita uh, spending in our schools, and we have very little to show for it. So his point isn't that this isn't an important problem or that we should give up on it. It's just that progress well, it, well, thus far has, has been well, hard I, to come I, by. I, and, we shouldn't, and, we shouldn't, and we shouldn't expect a miraculous well, uh, of course, I agree. Improvement in the human capital uh, scene in the next year or two. No, I, I agree that the, the situation is not going to turn. But I mean, how is it possible to be so hopeful about uh, technology in uh, areas of, uh, you know, uh, let's say extending the end of life and uh, healthcare and all that uh, on the one hand, but be so pessimistic about the possibilities for innovation and creative uh, 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 progress? Uh, in the area of, of human uh, and social uh, intercourse, uh, including the education and the development of all of our people. I mean, I grant you that there's many 
uh, an obstacle between it. But I have I, I see no reason why I should assume we had the 60s and the 60s failed. Therefore, social engineering is a bad idea. I, I mean, I object to that uh, across the board. I mean, that, that's a kind of moral and political uh, abdication that uh, that you know infuriates me. Uh, I, I, and again, I, nothing personal. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I, I don't feel that way, and neither does Tyler. So it's the issue. Okay, it's so. a, the issue isn't that it's a bad idea; it's that it's a hard it's a hard thing to accomplish. Oh, okay, but but. We spend what we spend on education, and we, we had mentioned that we might talk about some of the public employee debates and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, so I think that you, you, you said... So you we have, I, I just want to make this point, though, uh, Brent. I'm saying, yes, we spend, but that's not the right measure, you know? Uh, how many dollars we waste because our institutions are screwed up, uh, and, and, and we've got people with uh, their uh, snouts in a trough somewhere uh, who are able to therefore draw flows of resources into them such that when you account by looking at how much do we spend on quote-unquote education, you get a low number. Uh, I, I don't draw the conclusion from that that, uh, you know, reform, and I don't, I don't say that anybody disagrees with me here, and I doubt that you do, uh, reform with respect to how we deliver educational services has the potential to significantly increase the, uh, the efficacy of how those dollars are spent uh, and, and deliver better stuff for children. But, I mean, I, you know... Um, well, that's a, that's a, that's a okay. great segue to, uh, to what's been yeah, going on with segue, Johnson. Let's segue. Uh, uh, because, uh, so, I mean, at, at the very Can I just, can I just summarize my – on the limits of growth? Can I just summarize uh, – Brick, I'm sorry. I just wanted to put an uh, end on my views about the limit to growth. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, ideas are uh, in, in no way uh, a scarce resource because they depend ultimately on what we want to do and how we define ourselves. And so there's a kind of – you know, theorem there that there's some kind of unlearned thing. I think land is passe in a way because uh, there's, you know, uh, accepting agriculture, uh, you know, changing technology and whatnot, that the limits of, uh, you know, uh, okay. And I think the kids, uh, we really should challenge ourselves more to make use of the resources that we have, and I think there's still real possibilities there. Okay, so to wrap up on okay, this, let, let, me, uh, let me say I, I've criticized uh, uh, Tyler's thesis in a couple of uh, um, uh, blog posts, and also I addressed another issue, a kind of obstacle to growth that I think is real, uh, that, that Tyler doesn't spend a lot of time talking about, which is which is simply demographics. Um, that is, our employment to population ratio. The easiest way to increase GDP per capita, if that's your game, uh, is to get more and more a uh, higher and higher percentage of people working in the GDP production game. Uh, and we've been doing that uh, for, uh, for quite some time now. But we're going one, in the other direction. Yeah, right. One with the baby boom, uh, and then secondly with the huge infusion of women into the workforce. Uh, both of those have played out. Uh, women's participation in the workforce plateaued in the mid '90s, uh, and and male participation in the labor force is now starting to fall with the aging of the population. All of that is just going to go uh, south uh, in the future unless we have huge increases in immigration. Uh, but assuming we don't, uh, then our population well, is going to age. I didn't age. assume that. <laughs> right, right, right. So, but anyway, assuming that we don't, uh, on current courses, uh, our employment to population ratio is going to go down, and therefore that means that uh, that it's going to be harder to have GDP growth than it was in the past because we don't have this this sort of easy but, source, which is greater and greater mobilization of the population into doing economic production. Uh, okay, and so, so let me just say, by way of commentary, that, that just underscores my uh, plea that that uh, forecast about things of this kind be uh, uh, nested within a political economic model, yep. because uh, these things are not um, exogenous, and the, the, the immigration policy in particular is not exogenous, and the uh, capacity of the, uh, of the governing institutions to make changes in the rules of the game uh, in an ongoing way in response to the bottlenecks that end up being created because of the limits that a, a forecaster has presupposed based on some mechanical projections uh, sort of, uh, you know, gives the lie to the utility of those mechanical projections. So, you know, uh, surely our immigration policy will change to the extent that we are really up against it in terms of... Uh, of uh, scarcity of uh, productive labor because, you know, there, there's, uh, there's yeah. a buck in it. Um, up, up to now, we haven't been thinking about immigration in those terms at all. Uh, we've been seeing it as a yeah. as a threat to economic prosperity yeah. rather than as a prop for it. And, and if, if, the, if the question can get reframed, the reception uh, to the issue might change uh, and, and, and very likely will over time. Yeah. Um, 
So, so yeah, just on the education point, uh, you cut to the chase, but just to back up, you can say at first blush, uh, well, education's hard because American society viewed collectively has been putting more and more resources into education, and yet test scores haven't budged. And so that looks like education is maybe maybe it's hard to get any improvements because we tried really hard, at least in terms of devoting resources, uh, and we don't have much to show for it. The okay, obvious look. the obvious retort to that is that if you uh, that if you you know double or triple inputs into a system and get no better outputs, then your system is screwed up. Uh, no, and there's a fallacy here. Uh, uh, William Baumol, the great economist, Princeton economist, now I don't know if he's emeritus or what, made this yeah, observation back in the 60s. He made this observation in the 60s. He says, suppose you have general technical progress in an economy so that labor productivity is rising, so that right. real wages are, so real raises are wide, rising across the board. But suppose, as between different sectors, the labor-saving technical progress is uneven, and that there's some sectors that are just inherently more labor-intensive and uh, more difficult to make uh, hours worth of labor more productive in terms of whatever the measures of output than our other sectors. Wages are going to rise across the board because of competition and because of the labor saving improvements in the uh, more sensitive to technical progress sectors of the economy. And since they draw from a common labor market, yep. uh, dollars per hour are going to rise in the sector that, that hasn't experienced the same degree of labor saving. So for example, if the uh, uh, teacher to pupil ratio is fixed by some basic sort of technological thing about what goes on in the classroom, and it's not possible for the IT revolution to allow you to have a kindergarten of 300 children taught by one teacher, even though chips are way, way, way more faster than that, uh, and a lot of other goods are being produced much more efficiently because of those technical changes, then the relative bite on the budget of educational provision is going to go up. That would have happened just because of the... Uh, uh, asymmetric sectoral technical progress dynamic that I just mentioned. Yeah, it right. has no implication whatsoever about the extent to which those dollars are well or poorly spent for the measured output in the sector that has not experienced the labor saving technical change. Well, that's, that's clear? right. That, that is that is certainly a counter argument, and I think it, it, it is valid as far as it goes. How far it goes, I don't know. So it's the cost. Well, it's an empirical question ultimately, right. but the existence right. of the counter argument renders uh, specious the inferential. Uh, 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 practice of drawing a conclusion about the effectiveness of educational dollars spent by the share uh, that they're taking up in the budget. I mean, I don't think you can draw that conclusion from those data. I don't think those data identify the answer to the question that you're asking when you ask how effective are these uh, educational institutions being, or what should be our reasonable expectation of, about uh, the share of the budget. Yeah, so, so, anyway, so anyway. In, a, in, a, in an inherently and unavoidably labor-intensive Activity as personal services are, uh, right. and so uh, you know haircuts. Uh, you can't. You, you're you're always going to need four uh, musicians to, to produce a string quartet, right? It's just in the nature of things. Uh, you can't, uh, you're making the, this is the point. Prostitution has this property. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean nothing against teachers by making all of these various analogies, yeah. but it's an analytical point. It's a point right. about measure. But the big the, the big question, I guess, is. Uh, in the face of a, an amazing transformational revolution in informational technology, uh, is the fact that what goes on in a classroom today looks very much like what went on in a classroom uh, 100 years ago. Is is that just an inevitable cost disease? Because phenomenon that the only way we can teach people is uh, you know uh, uh, people in the you know face to face teachers in a classroom uh, or. Uh, is there something in the uh, structure of the American educational system or, or in the right. design of educational markets that is inhibiting this huge productivity enhancing technology from being infused into the system and revolutionizing the way we teach kids? So there's a little bit of a test case of that going on in the higher education market with these proprietary institutions that are distance learning and you know sort of web-based uh, degree granting uh, institutions. And I, I just saw something, you know, a little TV segment on it. I'm by no means an expert on this. The growth of these things, the strategies that they use to recruit, the questions about, uh, you know, the uh, extent to which uh, they are, you know, giving uh, real value for dollar in terms of human capital. And then also a kind of implicit question about the effectiveness of conventional institutions of higher education where, you know, as I know, because I have two kids going to these colleges, you send your kid to an elite college and it costs you 50 grand a year per kid, you know, and uh, they get a credential, and there's this whole kind of, um, I don't want to call it a game because it'll, it'll seem denigrating, but I mean, there's this whole kind of agreed upon and coordinated way of rationing opportunity 
Goldman Sachs is recruiting on Columbia University's campus these days. I happen to be visiting at Columbia, and a couple of my students are, you know, involved in the interview process, and I find it fascinating, uh, you know, how young masters of the universe are anointed, and the, the kabuki dance that they go through, these kids, uh, as they prepare themselves to, to, you know, come before this sort of legendary vetting that, you know, will open the, the, uh, the door for just a few of them to peek into where, you know, the light, right. et cetera. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> uh, I digress. My, my point is uh, we have a conventional way of credentializing and producing higher education, which because of technology could be subject to uh, significant uh, competitive pressure. You sit in an lecture hall uh, with another 150 kids and you hear Professor Lowry hold forth and you go and do your problem set, yep. or you log on with 150,000 other kids yep. uh, and you download something that Professor Lowry has prepared and you do your problem set. You know. So I, I think. Uh, so we'll as, see. We'll yeah, see how that how that yeah, shapes so, up. So, fact, we spend a lot more per pupil on, on K through 12 education now, and and people don't seem to be better educated. Maybe even they're worse educated. So, what's what's the cause? Is is the cost disease issue that you raised a part of it? I think absolutely. But but are there other factors? Is the increasing spending on not on teachers? Uh, but on uh, you know administrative overhead per student uh, is that waste? Is the is the um, is the fact that it is extraordinarily difficult to fire uh, poor teachers? Uh, yeah, that's got to be part, part of part of the problem. So that's got to be part. So I I I for one think that it would be just com just terrible complacency uh, to look at uh, the run up in spending and the stagnation in output. And say uh, system's yeah. fine. We just need more money. I think the system is broken, uh, and uh, and that there are huge shakeups uh, that could occur in the way in which kids are uh, are taught. But they can't occur because we have a system of monopoly provision, and we don't have competition amongst different people with different ideas like we do in other more dynamic sectors of the economy. And as a result, we're stuck uh, with uh, uh, with a with a very unproductive. Uh, educational system, which the the real human cost of which is tremendous, uh, which in, is what's in, uh, a, a, an unproductive system in which millions of people have a direct vested interest. Yes, uh, maybe tens of millions. Uh, direct. I mean, I, I'm actually stunned by the scale of the thing. Okay, when I learned uh, or heard, I don't even remember the number now. Uh, how many members there were of uh, teachers unions in the state of Wisconsin? I, I was just struck by you know the scale. I mean, it was tens of thousands. I was struck by the scale. Of it. Yeah, so this is so this is where I come at the whole Wisconsin hubbub. Uh, I, uh, I I don't have uh, any strong opinion as to whether public employees are overpaid or underpaid. I assume labor markets work there, and if they're underpaid, there'd be huge shortages, and if they're overpaid, there'd be huge queues. And I haven't heard it either. Uh, so uh, so I, I I'm not sure that that's a big deal. Uh, what what I what I do think is that collective bargaining of uh, in for teachers about the, how schools are run uh, and about how teachers are selected and let go uh, has, has thrown enormous amounts of sand in the gears of, of, of possible improvements in schooling, and that's, that's a terrible misfortune, and therefore I look at teachers' unions as, as an obstacle to progress, and so uh, it, uh, policy steps that move towards reducing the power of those unions to, uh, to block educational reform I see as salutary. Okay, there, you've said it. I, I mean, I, I have a view and I'll state it, but I wanted to kind of kind of lay the, lay the groundwork a little bit by um, going back to this, uh, I mean, you say competition, I mean, I, and, and I agree, I, I, you know, as an economist, but I, I think I'd say this even if I weren't, I agree that uh, we have, um, uh, where we have uh, institutions that are not functioning, opening things up and letting people get in and try different things. Okay, but that uh, try different things is a good idea, and that's likely to lead to the kind of innovation. Because if you ask the question in the abstract, you know, why are we spending this and we're not getting results, and what do you do? I mean, who knows? Nobody's smart enough to know. Right. You, you try a gazillion different things. Some of them prove to work. The ones that work, uh, in the end of the day, end up uh, gaining market share. Uh, so, uh, right. Um, uh, but there's a vested interest. This is what I, you know, the kind of political economy of it. I mean. Uh, this whole battle, for example, you mentioned Wisconsin, is uh, has an ideological, you know, Koch brothers. Uh, right. uh, the Democrats got their mojo back. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, we got tea parties on the right. Now we got some energy in the state house in Madison, Wisconsin, because you know hundreds and thousands of people have converged, and they're mad as hell, and they're not going to take it anymore. You know. Yeah. And it gets all factored into some larger, you know, the 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 public employee unions relationship to the Democratic Party. The defunding of the Democratic Party as a national political institution to the yep. extent that a wildfire of state capitals would reject, you know, paying the dues into the coffers automatically of the unions. Um, and and the allegations, the, the very political allegations, that there's something corrupt about the relationship between uh, public employee unions who are on one side of the bargaining table and the politicians into whose coffers they give dollars and uh, who they can run attack ads against negotiating with them on the other side of the table where the coin of the negotiation is some future generation's tax liabilities that these politicians are about to trade away. Something corrupt about that. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, this big, there's this big kind of uh, political uh, fight. So, I, you know, uh, where do I come down? Um, I don't get the rationale for public uh, sector unionization. Okay? Uh, I understand the historical development of it. I also understand the idea that people uh, banding together to collectively bargain allow themselves to have more power vis-a-vis -vis a large-scale employer who can, you know, is dealing with tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of them. And so there's a kind of evening of the power scale in the negotiation. But, you know, I grew up as an economist thinking about the opposition between labor and capital because there was profit on the table, the division right. of which surplus if in Marxian terms on the table, the division of which was a contested uh, uh, item. You know, there was, there was a struggle that was going on here. And while marginal productivity theory explained to me how markets would end up dividing uh, the surplus for production amongst the various factors, I never lost the feeling that there was real power struggle going on in the various industries and firms in which particular owners are facing over and against particular workers and negotiating over the terms of their employment. So unionization, in my mind, is a, is, a, is a valid and progressive thing insofar as it empowers workers who are in that position of being exploited uh, and misused and, and having their uh, contribution to surplus expropriated by somebody who's you know, just brought the money to the table. But when the people who are on the other side of the opposition are the public themselves, yes. the presumption of exploitation, there can be a bad public employer. They should have labor rights. You shouldn't be able to sexually harass people who work for the public sector and get away with it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? But the idea that there's some deep opposition here that unionization is the necessary counterweight to in order to prevent the uh, you know, misappropriation of the contribution of production for these, I don't get that at all. Right. Uh, public it's, servants. It's, I mean, another way of putting it is to say that you're a servant <laughs> you know, of the public. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I don't get the, I mean, this is at some kind of very abstract level of generality. Yep. Uh, I don't buy the analogy. And now, the fact that union movement in the United States has become mainly a public sector enterprise yep. because the consequences of globalization and technical progress and change have undercut the sinecures of the early post-war II world in which uh, trade and uh, industrial unions could uh, walk away with, you know, with a good little piece of change and a good yep. little uh, health care. You know, because that world doesn't exist anymore and never will come back. Right. Unionism and all of that uh, energy of labor opposition and the singing the songs, the swaying back and forth, and the Jesse Jackson and all of that stuff uh, has gotten into this backwater of, uh, uh, I mean, into this, this kind of uh, uh, small place of, of public service. And there's a kind of perversion there in, in my mind of, of, of what the real struggles are, a, a kind of uh, mystification uh, that's going on. Uh, I, I hope I don't offend, but uh, that's yeah, and it's and it's. Uh, I think it's you know curiously at odds with so the the public sector employee unions are a you know a, a bulwark of the Democratic Party, and they are they have stirred the passions of the progressive uh, left uh, in recent weeks. Yes, uh, and yet uh, the whole existence of public sector unions is premised upon a deep distrust of the democratic process. That is that we shouldn't set public sector salaries and benefits and working conditions by democratic process, but by, uh, but by contracts that then are immune to democratic reform, um, which is weird, uh, because it's normally on the right that you see this sort of uh, crusty distrust of democracy, but here, uh, in the service of, uh, of the economic interests of public employee unions, uh, you see uh, 
the metaphor of fighting exploitation from the private union uh, uh, context deployed in defense of what? Of, of Okay, well, but there's an interesting of, put, of, put, of putting public sector pay up outside the, uh, the the democratic process, which is no. Uh, I see your point, and I'm stimulated by it, Brent, because I, I I see I see this idea that to the extent that we have a contract that's binding on uh, future uh, state legislators and future governors that did, that specify the terms of employment uh, for the public workers, what we do is we we tie the hands of future electorates and their ability to in effect renegotiate politically. Uh, what those terms are by electing people who would uh, uh, insist on uh, different terms of employment uh, for these people, uh, so they can kind of lock themselves in. Uh, but yeah, so you, gonna, you have a deal between the you know the narrow interest group of the of the public employees and the uh, elected officials that that they have a large hand in electing, uh, and uh, yeah. and then everybody else gets cut out of the process because you can't uh, you can't fix it legislatively. So it's an interesting agency problem, uh, we would say. I mean, I think, I think you know, the, there's a kind of delegation thing that goes on between the public and the agents who act on behalf of the public uh, to negotiate. Uh, they are elected. The, they, there's a free speech thing that's going on on the part of uh, the uh, representatives of the workers because they do get to give the political campaigns. I can't imagine uh, that there would be a world in which union dues couldn't be used to uh, make, uh, you know, political activity. Uh, uh, engage in political activity because that would be undercutting uh, people's free speech. Right. Uh, and so you're kind of, you know, I mean, you, you, it, it, so there's a kind of institutional design problem here, it seems to me, where you want to say, what should the rules be such that, given the various second best constraints that we're operating under, we get on the whole, you know, the best outcome that we could expect to get. And those rules might include <laughs> the exclusion from collective bargaining of certain contractual provisions because they're especially susceptible, susceptible to inefficient uh, outcomes under the you know, under the uh, circumstances of uh, yeah. You know, but as, but as, as you mentioned, this is tied in with political power and also with people's passionate attachments to, to ideology. Um, and so I look as a policy wonk naively at how do we. How do we quit squandering the potential of so many people uh, who who could uh, uh, who could, with better schooling and better instruction, uh, be in a position to uh, to have better lives? And, and yeah. we see and we see that that question just isn't really very important to the people who are making the call. What they're thinking about are other things, like who's going to fund the Democratic Party, or or how how does how thrilling is it to march for uh, labor unions again and and to feel passionate again after being dispirited over the past couple of years. Uh, a friend, just on that point, uh, uh, my former colleague at Cato uh, and good friend Will Wilkinson had a, I thought, a very insightful blog post on the kind of uh, parallels between the Tea Party phenomenon and then this recent passion kicked up over Wisconsin. And, and in both cases, what you have is, is each side of the left-right spectrum's kind of creation myth being challenged. Uh, so the Tea Party folks see... Uh, the uh, recent, uh, uh, you know, the Obama administration, Democratic uh, Party, taking their country away, trashing the Constitution. Uh, they see this founding moment in Philadelphia as 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 what they are uh, rising up to defend. Although the the issues and animating concerns of the Tea Partiers are really very very different from those of the people in Philadelphia in 1787. Meanwhile, on the left, you have. Another creation myth being challenged, uh, which is the labor movement, uh, which is an absolute foundational kind of, of movement for uh, for people on the left, and and so we see unions under attack and collective bargaining rights being uh, being stripped, and it animates those ideas that our that our country is being taken away from us. And I'm sorry, I don't get the analogy. The, uh, the Tea Party's creation uh, myth is undermined by Obama's it, election because he's black. Is that? Is that no, no, the because he's you know he's passing uh, 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 health care uh, and and, and, and the creation the myth. These these Tea Partiers in Arizona and in uh, West Virginia and in Georgia. Their, their creation myth. You, you is, see is them. What? You know they're they're dressed with tricorner hats and uh, and uh, and the. the, the uh, okay. A real, a real focus on okay. the, the limited government under the Constitution. They're, they are, they are, uh, they, in their own words, uh, they are focused on restoring constitutional government, and they are looking back to uh, to what happened in Philadelphia uh, as 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 the principles that they. Oh, are I see. Tea Party. Okay, I'm sorry. I wasn't Tea operating party. literally yeah. enough, but uh, and I don't want to be a, a, a you know. 
naysayer about every <laughs> various species, so I'm not going to attack uh, Will Wilkinson's uh, yeah. uh, thing frontally anyway. <laughs> oh, in, in both cases, you I, I, and I, I will defend it uh, because uh, I think it's I think it's right uh, that you have people's identity tied up with a, with something okay. that happened something that happened in history, even though that thing that happened in history may not be very similar to what's going on now. So what what drove uh, the men in Philadelphia to, to write the Constitution was very different from what's from from you know TARP and the health care law, uh, and likewise. Uh, what's what what's at stake, and whether or not uh, Wisconsin public employees have the, the current range of collective bargaining rights is very different from what was going on when uh, when immigrant workers were getting billy clubbed by Pinkertons or mowed down by National Guardsmen. Uh, it's uh, and yet uh, the and they see themselves through this historical prism, uh, and uh, and that gets their passions flowing and. Uh, and, and well, their passions are indeed flowing, and, I, and, and insofar as the symmetry is to observe that, you know, there is a kind of uh, intensity distribution within either political alignment, and there, you know, therefore, I mean, people are heterogeneous with respect to their intensity, and so you want to look at where the energy is, and that, you know, there's going to be a narrative there, and uh, I mean, okay, I don't object uh, necessarily to try to, but I guess if, it just feels a little bit superficial to me. I mean, uh, again, with due respect, I don't. I'm not uh, saying uh, uh, there's no value in, in the thing, but I'm thinking, you know, what are the underlying fun fundamentals? And we were talking, with respect to unionization, we were talking about them. And I mean, the intellectual problem of having uh, a workers' movement end up being concentrated amongst uh, public employees who are, uh, uh, you know, trying to prevent the government from privatizing services. That's what I wanted to just mention a, a kind of, you know, sort of test case. When I said it's an it's it's an issue of uh, designing what the rules of the game should be, so that our agents will produce the least bad outcome when they engage in their imperfect interactions with each other. One of the things I was thinking about is, you know, unions are bargaining with public officials over work rules and conditions of, of the administration and delivery of public services, which constrain them from uh, engaging in activities that might lead to very significant improvement in the efficiency of the delivery of public services. Now that's as old as unionism, this idea of trying to protect the work and prevent uh, the outside kind of thing. But why right. should the public sector, uh, in, a, in a world of tight budgets and uh, over-committed obligation, uh, be, have it be hamstrung uh, by uh, uh, the, the, uh, this kind of uh, work rule imposition that prevents the et cetera, et cetera. So, <clears throat> yeah, uh, so, so I, 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 I agree with you. I was, I was <laughs> making the point that to the people who are marching uh, but and, I, I, and they're not just the public employees. There are lots of other people who, who but, think that, that American basic freedoms are under assault. They, they're not seeing this in terms of being against democracy or, or being against competition and accountability. They're, they're seeing it a different way, which is part of the obstacle to making things different. Okay, but, but, but uh, uh, I had an impl uh, implication that I wanted to draw with respect to the, the, the opposition between the people in the State House in Madison and the Tea Party people uh, in yep. uh, in the summer of 2009, when they, you know, they came out against the healthcare stuff, which is, which is, the labor people have a losing hand. Yes. In my opinion, the Tea Party people do not necessarily have a losing hand. I'm not endorsing them, and I'm not sort of worshiping some kind of uh, fetishism about uh, the Constitution and the founding of the country. I'm just my sense of it is that the political future, the energy that you're seeing organizing in, in the Tea Party, that there's a real future there. It's going to be influencing our politics for years to come. And what I see in Wisconsin is a death knell, and it almost, that puts it a little dramatically, but it has a gaspy kind of in-note yeah. uh, sound to it. And I, and I think the central fact is the same to the, uh, that's driving both the waxing fortunes of Tea Party-style concerns and, and uh, waning fortunes of labor concerns, and that is we're running out of money, uh, so <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. The, 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 it plays in each, you're right. It plays in favor of the Tea Party, and it plays against right. And so, the, if there if there is a if there is a central policy concern of the Tea Partiers, it's runaway government spending, uh, and you know they're right. Uh, yeah, we're, exactly. we're, That's we're, we're heading towards fiscal Armageddon, and so right. more and more uh, that you know that. Uh, attention is going to get paid to that concern, uh, and likewise, uh, because we're running out of money, we're going to look for ways to save money and spending, uh, and, and you know, c curtailing uh, the yeah. uh, privileges of public sector employees is going to be one way to save money. Uh, 
Great. My clock says one hour and four minutes. I think yes. that's uh, the optimal We're or maybe even overly optimal length for a blog hands conversation. I've enjoyed it. We're done. All right. Very nice talking to you, and uh, look forward to doing it again sometime. Okay. You bet. All right. Bye-bye.